Hola, it's Kyle talking about Mexico. It's our next door neighbor, but is often misunderstood. In the history books and in the old Western movies and on the news, Mexico is always the bad guy. So in this video, I want to talk about the geography of the country, the economy, the people, the culture, the music, and the food. There's even going to be a cooking demonstration. So keep watching if you want to learn a little bit more about our neighbors to the south. I'm going to start off with just the basic Wikipedia stuff here before getting into more detail. It has a population of about 130 million, so it's the 10th most populous nation on Earth, and it's also the largest Spanish-speaking country on Earth. It's the 13th largest country in terms of area, and it's the 15th largest economy on Earth. So with it being highly populous, one of the largest countries, one of the biggest economies, Mexico is actually a major player on a global scale. But it's a pretty poor country as well, with a per capita income of about $9,000, and even though it is pretty poor, it's in the upper 50 percentile in terms of wealthy nations on Earth. There are more countries that are poorer than Mexico than wealthier. So that's a pretty sad reflection of the state of the global economy when a poor country like Mexico is in the upper 50 percentile. With a per capita income of about $9,000, it's wealthier than China and right on par with Brazil, which are both pretty poor countries, but they're not destitute. And it's also not far behind Russia. So Russia really isn't very far ahead of Mexico at all in terms of per capita income and overall economy. It has a higher per capita income than most of the former Soviet bloc countries in Eastern Europe. So Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, Bosnia, Serbia, Macedonia, and Albania are all poorer than Mexico. Mexico is wealthier than all the countries of South Asia, most of the ones in Southeast Asia. It's wealthier than every country on the African continent. And it's wealthier than the countries that borders to the south, Belize and Guatemala. So you can see where Mexico can be in the upper 50 percentile, even though it is pretty poor. But there's much more disparity of wealth in Mexico than most other countries on the planet. For example, Mexico City has about 9 million people with a metropolitan area of about 22 million. And there are millions of people in Mexico City that live at the U.S. middle class level or just slightly below. And there are plenty of people that are super rich in Mexico City. But... There are many more millions of people that are living in abject poverty, some incredibly bad slums in the outskirts of the city. So you do have a lot of wealth, but you also have much more poverty. The country is divided up into 31 states and a federal district, or the DFA. It's kind of like how we have D.C. So Mexico City isn't a state. It's, you know, it's the federal district. And the most populous state is the one called Mexico State, which is the one that surrounds Mexico City, but doesn't include Mexico City. So, you know, that's not confusing at all. But... There are about 14.5 million people in Mexico State. The next most populous state is Veracruz along the East Coast with about 7 million. The least populous state is Baja California Sur, which is the southern half of the Baja Peninsula. Basically just open desert plus the beach resort towns of the Los Cabos area. And you have about 500,000 people in that state. The state with the highest per capita income is Nuevo Leon, right along the border with Texas, with a per capita income of about 16,000. So the wealthiest Mexican state has half the per capita income of the poorest U.S. state, which is Mississippi. The wealthiest city in the country is Monterey. And if you're from California, Monterey, Mexico has two R's. has a per capita income of about 35000 in Monterey. So that's wealthier than Mississippi or Idaho and right on par with the other poor U.S. states of Arkansas and West Virginia. So, you know, with Mexico City having a decently high per capita income and Monterey having, you know, this on par with some of the poorer parts of the U.S., how can Mexico possibly be as poor as it is with these places that really aren't that terribly poor. Well, it's because the south of the country is extremely poor. So once you get to the more tropical areas in the south, right along the Guatemala border, it's an incredible poverty down there. This is where you have a predominantly indigenous population. So just like in the U.S., the people that were here first are now the poorest. So the south part of Mexico is every bit as poor as you're going to get in Africa or Southeast Asia. It's just that the other parts of the country can kind of balance it out a little bit to where the overall country isn't super poor, but... Yeah, the south of Mexico is extremely poor. The second largest city in the country is Guadalajara with a population of about one and a half million and a metro area population of around five million. So it's right on par with Atlanta. It's in the southwestern portion of the country in the state of Jalisco. And Guadalajara is home to one of the most iconic aspects of Mexican culture. Mariachi music got to start right in the city. And also not too far from Guadalajara is the town of Tequila. So you can imagine what got to start there. And for something to be officially called tequila, it has to be originated from the state of Jalisco, but Guadalajara, second biggest city in the country. In discussing the people of Mexico, the term Mexican is a nationality, like American or Canadian, and can refer to all different types of races and ethnicities that makes up the population. 
The majority of the folks in Mexico will be classified as mestizo, which is a mix of European, predominantly Spanish, and indigenous ancestry. But within the mestizo population, there can be a pretty wide range of the ancestry. So you have folks at one end of the spectrum that are predominantly European with just a little bit of indigenous ancestry that can be pretty fair-skinned or even blue-eyed. At the other end of the spectrum, you have, say, my dad and my dad's side of the family, and they'd be classified as mestizo as well, but the ancestry is predominantly indigenous with a smaller amount that is European, and that's Basque, and so his skin is darker and has more Amerindian facial features, and the reason why I look the way I do is that my mom is a ginger and my dad being mestizo means I have, you know, kind of red facial hair and dark head hair, but anyway, you can be a pretty wide range, dark skin, light skin, and still be considered mestizo. You also have a large number of people that are entirely indigenous, and these are mostly in the south part of the country and are primarily descendants of the ancient Mayans. You also have a fairly small population of black folks that are referred to as Afro-Mexicans who live primarily on the east coast, especially in and around Veracruz. There's also a fairly sizable Jewish community in Mexico City, and you've also had a decent number of Chinese and Korean immigrants. So just like American or Canadian, Mexican could be a wide range of ethnicities, but most people would be classified as mestizo. The majority of people in Mexico are Catholic, but Mexico has a long history of not wanting to be tied to the Catholic Church. There's separation of church and state in the country, and one of the main reasons why Mexico wanted to gain independence from Spain was to get away from being under Vatican rule. Mexican Catholicism is a little unique in that there is reverence for the Virgin of Guadalupe. And you've undoubtedly seen images of this. It's an important symbol of Mexican culture. However, many mainstream Catholics look down upon the Mexican Catholicism and the stories of the Virgin of Guadalupe, similarly to how many mainstream Protestants look down upon Mormons for Joseph Smith and the stories that surrounded him. All right, so now that I've discussed the basic stats, the demographics, and the religion, I want to get more into the fun stuff, starting with the food. All right, I was recording when talking about the food, and I was like, man, this is making me hungry. I'm going to go ahead and cook something up while talking about the food. So if you've ever been to a Mexican restaurant in the U.S., it was probably Tex-Mex. So if you've had burritos or anything with flour tortillas, stuff with beef like carne asada or chili con carne or fajitas, nachos, or really anything with yellow cheese, that's Tex-Mex. And that's all very good, but that's not something you're going to get authentic food in Mexico. So... What I'm cooking up here are some shrimp tacos, and I've got some tamales steaming right here. So if you're going to do the tacos, start off with corn tortillas. It's got to be corn. You're not really going to get flour in Mexico unless it's at a you know, beach resort town with a lot of tours. So got my cast iron skillet here. So drop the tortilla in there. I usually do about 20 seconds per side. That's a personal preference, though. But don't do the gringo thing and put the uh, corn tortilla in the microwave. It's not going to turn out too well. Um, I've already got some tortillas done right here, so what I'm going to do is add some of the shrimp to the tortillas. I used to do about four uh, per one. These are pretty small shrimp, so it really depends on the size of the shrimp. And you would get these more in uh, Baja. If you're in more of the interior parts of Mexico, you might get different types of beef or different types of pork or Maybe lengua. If you've ever seen lengua on the menu, that's tongue. So don't be afraid of that. It's really good. It has the same taste and consistency as roast beef. So go ahead and give it a try. I think you really like it. And I'm going to move the camera over here a little bit. This is some of the stuff that you might see topped on a more authentic Mexican taco. So got some carrots here. So I'm going to put a few carrots on each one. Uh, they might be pickled which sounds kind of gross, but pickled carrots are actually really good. Now, these are just regular, though. I just kind of shaved a couple of carrots. Um, some cabbage. Not so much lettuce, but cabbage. Drop that on there. I don't have any diced onions. Pretend like I do, so I'm putting on the onions right now. Um, and cilantro. A lot of people don't like cilantro. Uh, when I make these for my wife, I don't use cilantro because she doesn't like it, but these aren't for her, so cilantro for me. And very important for me are the sauces. And I got some really hot sauces here. This is my favorite one. It's kind of shelf is empty, so it's pretty good in the case. It's my favorite one. Um, put some of that on there. And uh, my friend made this one. <laughs> this is a habanero sauce. This stuff is brutal. You can't put that much on there. It'll probably die. I mean, you probably will actually die if you put too much stuff on here. But I'm going to put some of that on there. So this is more like what you would get. In Mexico, these are more authentic style tacos. They're still kind of gringo the way I do them, but you know, much closer to what you're going to actually get 
in Mexico. And over here, I'm steaming the tamales. And my wife actually made these. My half German, half Norwegian wife from South Carolina made these. She learned how to make them at a tamale making party. And they're very labor intensive, very time consuming to make them. And it's almost like an assembly line of people that are to making them for, you know, if you have tamales. And because it's such a big deal to make them, so labor intensive, they're popular during the holidays. So a lot of people have them on Christmas. And that's what we do. We have tamales on Christmas. And what they are is cornmeal stuffed with some type of meat wrapped in a corn husk. So I'm going to take the corn husk off there. And if you look inside, this is on the inside, she, being from South Carolina, she made them with pulled pork shoulder, so it's kind of like southern style tamales. They're really, really good. If you're in the more tropical parts of Mexico, uh, they might be wrapped in banana leaves, but it's kind of the same thing. So, got my tacos here, tamale here. I'm gonna go ahead and chow down on these, and I'm gonna, you know, start talking about whatever I can talk about after the food. So yeah. All right. So now that my belly's full, I'm gonna talk about the music and. There are lots of different types of music that are popular in Mexico, but I'm going to talk about just two of the most popular types. When a lot of folks think of Mexican music, the first thing they're going to think of is mariachi. These are the big bands with the melodic vocals, but you don't really hear a lot of people playing this kind of music in the U.S. It's almost kind of cliche here where you might hire a mariachi band for your birthday party kind of thing. But if you hear Mexican music in the U.S., it's most likely going to be Norteño. These are much smaller bands, usually with an accordion player. It's, it's kind of the Mexican version of country music. A lot of cowboy hats, a lot of cowboy boots, and most of the bands are called the Somethings from Somewhere. And the band I'm playing now is called Los Originales de San Juan. There's another band called Los Tucanas de Tijuana. I mean, look at these guys. You see a band dressed like this, you know it's going to be fantastic. And uh, the Beatles of Norteño music are Los Tigres del Norte. And, they're the only Norteño band to have a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, so it shows you how this kind of thing transcended into American culture. But, you know, you're really going to hear Norteño music a lot more in the U.S. and not so much mariachi, but these are just two of the many types of music that are popular in Mexico. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the economy. With Mexico being the 15th largest economy on Earth, there's obviously a lot going on. The economy is fairly well diversified. It's become a major world player in manufacturing, especially in the automotive sector. There are many automotive assembly plants in the country. Ford has three, VW has two, Honda has two, Nissan has three, GM has three, BMW has two, Chrysler has two, Toyota, Mercedes, Mazda, and Kia each have one. Giant Motors, which is a Chinese company, has a, a plant there. That's kind of ironic to have a Chinese plant export jobs to Mexico for automotive assembly. Uh, Kenworth and Volvo trucks are made there, Cummins diesel engines as well, so a lot of automotive stuff going on in Mexico. The country also relies heavily on tourism. It's the number eight visited country in the world in terms of foreign visitors. You've got the major beach resort towns of Cancun and the other parts of the Yucatan Peninsula, Puerto Vallarta, the Los Cabos area, Acapulco, Mazatlan, so many beach resort towns. A lot of people visit the Mayan ruins also in the Yucatan Peninsula. Mexico City is a big draw. So there's a lot of reasons why people are going to Mexico, and that's why it's one of the biggest tourist destinations in the world. It's also the 12th largest producer of oil in the world and has a 19th largest oil reserves. But it's becoming a smaller and smaller part of the Mexican economy. They're not really relying on oil as much as they used to. Mexico's economy is growing. It's not setting the world on fire, but by the year 2030, it's expected to be even more highly ranked than it is now. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the physical geography a little bit and some of the natural aspects of the country. Mexico City sits at an elevation of 7,300 feet or 2,200 meters, and it's the eighth highest elevation capital city in the world. In the north central part of the country, you have the Copper Canyon, which is a series of six canyons that makes up a large system, and it's much deeper than the Grand Canyon here in the U.S., the Grand Canyon is larger than any of the single canyons that makes up the Copper Canyon, but the entire Copper Canyon system is much larger than the Grand Canyon. The Yucatan Peninsula is basically one chunk of limestone, pretty similar to Florida, and just like Florida, there are a lot of underwater caves there. You have these giant cenotes, which are you know naturally occurring vertical pits when the limestone erodes, and 
Mexico is one of the top world destinations for caving and cave diving. And I do a lot of caving, but I'll never do cave diving. It's extremely dangerous, but Mexico is one of the most popular places in the world to be doing that kind of stuff. It's also one of the most disaster prone countries in the world. There have been 18 magnitude 5.5 or greater earthquakes just in the past 30 years. There have also been nine major hurricanes make landfall in Mexico in the past 30 years. And there's a threat of other geological hazards such as tsunami and active volcanoes. So between the earthquakes and hurricanes, the potential threat from the tsunamis and volcanoes, Mexico is very susceptible to many different types of natural hazards. Mexico is also home to two of my favorite animals in the world. The jaguar, I think, is the most beautiful cat on the planet, and it's critically endangered. There aren't that many left, but one thing that's cool is an occasional stray jaguar makes its way into Texas. And my absolute favorite animals on the planet are bats, and the Mexican free-tailed bat is the largest mammal population that are not rodents in North America. And a lot of them migrate to Texas in the summertime, so there's a really famous spot in Austin where they gather underneath a bridge, and you can check them out flying each evening. And surprisingly enough, the Mexican free-tailed bat is the fastest animal on the planet. A cheetah couldn't come even close to catching a Mexican free-tailed bat. They can fly at 100 miles an hour or 160 kilometers an hour. And the last thing that I'm going to discuss is history. And I'm not going to get into the entire history of Mexico, but just a couple of events that were really important to the U.S. The first is the Battle of the Alamo in 1836. And I'm sure I'm going to ruffle a few feathers here, but I'm not trying to sugarcoat things either. Just going over what the Alamo battle was actually about. After Mexico gained independence from Spain, one of the first things they did was outlaw slavery in 1829. At that time, Texas was still part of Mexico, but didn't want to give up slavery. And one of the main reasons why they wanted to form the Republic of Texas was to keep slavery. And in fact, part of their declaration for the formation of the Republic was that if slavery were ever outlawed in the southern states of the U.S., people would be more than welcome to bring their slaves into Texas. This, of course, outraged the government of Mexico, so they sent troops into Texas to keep the Republic of Texas from being formed and to abolish slavery. So unless you're a fan of slavery, Mexico were definitely the good guys at the Battle of the Alamo. The second event I wanted to mention is Cinco de Mayo, and there are two main camps on why this is celebrated in the U.S. The first are people that think it's Mexican Independence Day, which is not, and then the people that call those people out because, you know, we're so stupid to be celebrating in the U.S. when they don't even celebrate it in Mexico. Well... They're both wrong. There's actually a completely legitimate reason why Cinco de Mayo is celebrated more in the U.S. than in Mexico. What Cinco de Mayo references is the Battle of Puebla that took place on May 5th, 1862. And this is when the French army invaded Mexico trying to make Mexico part of the French Empire. And of course, in 1862, the U.S. was in the middle of our own civil war. And Mexico was worried that the Confederacy was going to advance to the West and bring slavery to the predominantly Mexican population in the southwestern U.S., and although the French government was officially neutral during the U.S. Civil War, they were hoping for a Confederate win. So on May 5th, 1862, the Mexican army defeated the French army, which was a huge upset, as it was essentially a peasant militia that defeated one of the strongest armies in the world at the time. So the news eventually reached the U.S., and especially in California, which had a predominantly Mexican population, it was a cause for a huge celebration because they were worried that France was going to win and take over Mexico. But the reason why it isn't celebrated in Mexico as much as it is in the U.S. is that Mexico lost the war. So why are we going to celebrate winning a battle when we lost the entire war? So in the U.S., it's a day to remember a symbol of freedom, even though you fast forward 150 years, it's just an excuse to drink and party in the streets. Kind of like St. Patrick's Day, I'm sure there's a pretty legitimate origin of that day, but now it's just an excuse to drink and party in the streets. So those are the, some of the major aspects of Mexico that I wanted to discuss in this video. And even though it's right next to us, we don't often hear that much about it, except for illegal immigration, drug cartels, or when there is a big disaster, we'll hear about it then. But there's a lot more to Mexico than that. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, but it isn't all the giant train wreck as it's portrayed in the media. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve. And if you're interested in stuff like this, some nerdy geography stuff, stuff about road tripping across the U.S., some other travel kind of stuff, then consider subscribing to this channel. That's the kind of stuff that I'm posting. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King's hunting out. I'm about to go flip the switches on my lowrider.